we are um, showing now and uh, inviting two Documenta 15 artists. This is uh, Saudat Ismailova and Nigun Trinti. Um, both are uh, participating here with um, already existing filmic work and uh, they will present excerpts of these films, otherwise they would be too long, and then uh, will be connected live to comment them. And um, this is a nice kind of, uh, let's say, also introduction and still introduction to the day because it is like the very artistic part of what sustainability can mean in the framework of art. And uh, I hope you enjoy. So we start with Saudat Ismailova from Uzbekistan.
yürüyorsun lan fırsın. Yaptım. Ama ne kadar kışı var yanına yürüyorum. Oğlum yedi sekiz yaşımdan hoşluk yürütken, çok şaşırtık yürütken bana. Akem azında gitse tüslerge, kişilerge tamam gelip kop. Yertege kandırıştı bu dedi ona. Yertege var, alt gelemiz.
жылына су болмай қалды бұл жерде. Көп қалды жерлер. Оке, енді 2 жылдан бері келіп тұрды қазір су жақсы. Мәңгі іштейтін іш болмайды. Анасы жан жаққа кетті, Қазақстанға кетті өзі. Әзі құдаға шүкер яқшы әмір. Әй, қайтыма су кезетті көлем сөздер. Барсылық құлатты көлем. Су бұлады енді. Жылдан жылға жақсы ол қазір келіп әдір су. Бұрынғыда емес. Жоқ бұлатты көлемі. Қырық жылда ел өз күреттейді ол сондай суам келеді. Құдаға әзі насып баса. Енді аралымыз тұрса, өш жақсы бұл Hello everybody. Um, so shall I just start speaking? Do you hear me? Yes. Saudat. Yes, all good. Okay, great. Hi Sauda, this is Andrea. Good. Hello. Uh, <laughs> thanks for showing this film uh, to us and I'm super happy that you are here with us now, and it would be great to hear some words uh, from you about the film, the idea behind it, uh, the uh, Aral Sea and uh, the fishermen that play a decent role um, as the community that lives from the Aral Sea that uh, kind of fades away, no? so thanks. Thank you. Well, there is uh, two, two important uh, points that I would like to mention in the beginning is that this documentary film was done in 2003. And uh, uh, so it's almost two decades ago. Um, and it's 52 minutes documentary. So for today's screening, we uh, cut it to 15 minutes. So um, you just have a glimpse. Uh, but in fact, it's, um, uh, it's 52 minutes film. Um, so you are not surprised the way it is constructed. Uh, another thing I really would like to say, it's very strange because uh, we are having, uh, I'm in Tashkent now in Uzbekistan, we are having uh, um, a sand, uh, sand dust that we never had and never experienced before. Uh, it's actually something quite uncomfortable because if some of you have ever seen the film Interstellar of uh, Christopher Nolan, that probably would be the closest 
uh, association and uh, I'm actually not mystifying it because it started yesterday night. Uh, we thought it was fog, but we woke up and all the trees, cars, streets are covered by um, dust. So uh, the morning conversation at the breakfast started like, okay, what, what could be the reason? We have never seen asking parents, asking elder people. And um, we don't know. And uh, like my father was saying, it might be for the RLC, but I think it's something uh, bigger than that, in fact. So um, speaking about uh, Uzbekistan also, like Central Asia, I think it's also important to put your mind into the ge geography. Um, it's, uh, it's a piece of land that uh, was in the Soviet Union. Um, uh, today we are independent, so it's in between, in between China, Afghanistan, uh, Caspian Sea, and Russia. Um, so we don't have uh, access to any ocean or to any sea, actually. And Uzbekistan is the second um, country in the world that is uh, double landlocked. So for us to get to the sea, we need to cross two countries. So that means uh, that for us, uh, water is extremely precious and it has been always um, clear for us that how precious water is. And it was more given also through the traditions, you know, within the family that we should appreciate water, we should, how we should take care of water. And there is a certain fear of water as well, you know, in our culture, because we are not accustomed to live close to the water. And uh, Uzbekistan, uh, exist thanks to this big river Samudaria and Sirdaria uh, that appear from the glaciers in Tianshan Mountains and Pre Himalayas, and these two rivers flow into the Aral Sea. So it's like they meet together in the Aral Sea. That's uh, that's how the geography is. But the Aral Sea starts shrinking from 1960s uh, because of the mismanagement of the water during the Soviet period, as they wanted to. Um, create a, 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 a mono uh, a mono economy. Uh, it became a country that would produce cotton, which we call a white gold. So the the rivers were um, rearranged. Uh, the canals were created uh, to uh, to provide with the uh, with cotton. So um, from 1960, they start noticing that uh, the RLC is, is starting kind of losing its uh, water. And then, uh, of course, by the period of the uh, perestroika, by the collapse of Soviet Union, I already remember as a small child, this subject became um, already quite critical uh, that we're going to lose this, um, what we call sea. It's actually not a sea. It's, uh, it's an inland lake. Uh, it was the fourth biggest lake in the world, Indian Lake. So um, the sea is drying and uh, in the film it's uh, interesting to see that uh, it was written that they say that it might dry by 2010, but there is still some leftovers and the last report I read like a few months ago, uh, it's probably going to last until 2035. And then uh, there is, we call it already a desert, Aral Desert. It's not anymore called um, a sea. So, of course, there is here there is a, uh, a background related to economy, to a political background of the country history, like a recent history that happened. Uh, but uh, when uh, we went with Carlos Casas to uh, Karakal, Pakistan, to make this documentary, I hope you notice there is an amazing strength uh, in people and a belief to continue to live uh, and um, believe that um, some, somehow the water can come back uh, and they stay with this faith on that land. So, um, uh, of course, there is uh, big health issues. Uh, there is a, a, another problem is that when you arrive there, you don't really understand what why people still continue living there because it's like a ghost towns um, and the only way for them to survive is actually to block uh, the leftovers of the river that arrive uh, and they fish and so they just fish a couple of fishes a day and that's what they eat. Um, it is also quite far away from the center in sense that the Muinak it was a port city and to get there, it's a three hours drive from the closest big city. So it's very isolated. And when you get there, you really get, and then 
it's it's an, a striking image, you know. It's a ghost presence. Like the, the town is already gone. You you don't understand what people are doing there, you know. Um, it kind of logically calls itself for. Okay, I mean there is no way to to bring the water back, and uh, if it makes sense for people to stay there to continue living. Um, of course, when we made this documentary, I remember there were a lot of questions like this documentary doesn't show the catast catastrophe or the, the real critical situation of the, um, of the disappearance of the sea. But as I said in the beginning, in fact, we were interested in human stories on these fishermen. Uh, we went there and we looked for them for uh, three weeks. We interviewed a lot of fishermen and uh, we stayed in the house of one of the fishermen really lived with them. Um, it is not only because there, were, there are no hotels or no conditions, uh, but it also was good for us to approach these people and to, to share a moment together. Um, uh, so there is a Jumagul, an old man, uh, who was a captain in the sea, who had a very clear memory, who could speak about the sea endlessly. Then there was this middle-aged man that had to feed his family. Um, but his only way to survive was fishing that couple of fishes a day. And there is also a problem of alcoholism, I should say. And then there was this uh, younger uh, man of 20 years old that, in fact, would go... Uh, there are leftovers of these boats. Uh, so what they do is that they cut out the metal pieces and they sell that. So. It's like whatever they find, they try to use it for their survival. I mean, that was the picture in 2003 when we were filming. <coughs> Excuse me. And then there is this small boy that doesn't believe that there was a sea because he says, why I should believe in that, you know? I have never seen it with my eyes. So uh, these four characters were quite um, interesting. And uh, also it was interesting to see that there is a hope for the water to come back. An old man saying, well, maybe if there is no water, maybe they're going to find the gas or oil and we will continue living here. So each one had its own uh, projection or a hope to stay there. This is also interesting, you know, like this connection of a human to the land where, uh, to the environment they, um, they, grow, uh, they grow in. So... Um, this is more or less what I wanted to say, and uh, if you have questions, we can speak. But uh, uh, I would also like to add that it was uh, my second encounter with the uh, with the RL seats. Uh, I was born in Tashkent, and RL seats uh, around 1,200 kilometers from my hometown. It's inhabited by the Karakalpak people that speak slightly different, uh, lang well, quite different, well, a different language, and. Um, in 2016, I went back, I made a, a three-screen installation, again, related to the water, to the Amudaria River, how it goes from its sources on the glaciers, and it dies before arriving to, to the Aral Sea, so it's like from the birth to death of the river. And then I also work, made another work called The Haunted, about um, a Turan tiger, it's a specific local type of tigers that lived uh, on the banks of the uh, of the Aral and Sirdar uh, of the Aral, Amudaria and Sirdaria. This type of animal has ex extincted also like in 70s. So it's all this disappearance, extinction um, in the environment and landscape that I try to capture in my work, certain type of absence. Um, and um, so uh, I kind of worked with, I, with three works around the same subject, more or less, and I think it's going to continue as well. So that many thanks uh, for the presentation and also for commenting so intensively on this work, telling us the stories behind it, uh, which is very precious because I have to say that I think the situation of the Aralsee, the Aral Sea, is kind of known. This is something known in the world, but to to be able to really imagine what it means for the people who live there and who have their home there and who live from the sea as fishermen is something that we might not be able to understand from afar. So um, I uh, think that 
uh, yeah, your explanations were super, but also the film is very emotional, I have to say, and um, um, yeah, and it's kind of, even though the topic is kind of in the air, it's kind of eye-opening, I think. So thanks a lot. I would, uh, I would uh, kind of second your uh, um, question and uh, uh, being open for questions from the audience, maybe, and uh, would like to ask you here in the room if you would like to say something uh, about it, to ask Saudat um, questions, please feel free. We will be able to also translate, as said, and... Uh, Maybe I stand up just to see if I can see some hands. There is one. <laughs> there, just a second. There is my colleague coming. Okay. It's okay. So good morning and thank you. Um, I guess it's always a matter of economy, economics, and making money. But who is responsible for taking water out of the rivers today? Now you mentioned the two rivers who um, go into the Aral Sea, and who takes the water out today? Who is responsible? Well, it's, um, I, don't, I think it's difficult to put uh, a responsibility on some, someone because it has been 30 years that we became independent, and during the 30 years the question was not solved because it's an, an enormous um, infrastructure, the irrigation system, you know, how to change all this irrigation system in the region. I believe uh, it's a work, it's either a very big investment or investments or it's a regional, it's a regional question, you know. So it's not only a question of one country because Aral is divided between Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, but uh, Turkmenistan takes a lot of water from the Aral Sea and of course it becomes a, uh, a complicated question today when the countries became independent, you know, so it's really a, a conflict, a conflict. It's a question that can bring to a conflict between the countries. Um, again, because the water is so precious here, and uh, as in the 70 years of our past in the Soviet Union, it was divided in a way um, that today to bring, to claim to bring them back, I really don't know how, um, how they could uh, solve this issue. But uh, there is uh, also a, another fragment in the history. They say that in 1979, a part of the Amudarya River was given to Afghanistan. You know? So it was a part of a big policy of uh, uh, Moscow you know, to start approaching Afghanistan. How do you cut those um, uh, how do you say, leaks of water? You know? you, uh, it's it's um, uh, First of all, it's a political question, then it's a question of finding the, I guess, solutions uh, to rethink the irrigation, to rethink the, the question of the cotton as well. I think that they are making some effort that uh, it's not anymore a mono, monoculture, because uh, Uzbekistan is actually, was always very fruitful for other types of um, um, grain and uh, vegetables and fruits, it's, it's, the land is, is is fruitful, but uh, it became really like a limited monoculture of cotton. And this they try to change. This I should say that it, it is changing, so it's not any more focused on, on cotton. But uh, to change the whole system of irrigation, to deal with the neighboring countries that all became independent, uh, I think that it's, um, it's not an easy question to, to go over. Um, so that thanks. It is actually the case that the question of monocultures, even though you're saying that it's not only focused on cotton monocultures at the Aralsi any longer, but for the film, this is also like a very important topic. And uh, this will also be a topic uh, later on uh, for monocultures in the rainforest in Indonesia uh, regarding the palm oil and other uh, let's say, farm uh, industry. Uh, this will also be a topic uh, later on uh, in the presentation of uh, Fernando Garcia Dori from Inland, who will speak about eucalyptus trees and monocultures in Portugal and Spain. 
So this is something uh, that uh, we will maybe also can discuss later on uh, in the panel. If there are no other questions, I would now uh, give another big thank you uh, to thank be part you. of this. Uh, Saudat, thanks again. Thank you.